think this year is a uh, goes for celebration because it was it's the 200th birthday of the great scientist, but also because it's uh, 150 years after his publication of the book on the origin of the species, a book that was to change the place of man from the one who had dominion over the rest of the animal kingdom to be just one species out of a hundred million others and another thing that book brought us was the tree of life the fact that all living creatures around us today are related by common distance so we have common ancestors with every species you can find out there such as uh, even the cows or anything else um, in this lecture i'll tell you a bit about the theory of evolution by natural selection and uh, I'll try to tell you about how we, we construct the tree of life. You may have seen such a family tree before, and that's what I intend to tell you about later. So, as I said, the theory explains the origin of the vast diversity of life on Earth. And before I begin to tell you about the story itself, I need to define what a species is. And in this case, it's a population of organisms capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. In this case, they pass on their characteristics. And quick introduction to genetics. Our bodies are built according to the specifications in our DNA. The characteristics such as the body plan, for example, we are tetrapods with a body, four limbs, five appendages at the end, and a head on top. That's all coded by genes and we have two copies of uh, each gene, one inherited from the mother and one inherited from the father. Now, those genes could actually be the same version of the genes, such as the eye color. I have two uh, genes that code for brown eyes, whereas someone may have a different version, such as one that code for brown and blue, in which case the eye would be brown, because the brown gene is dominant. And we call these different versions of these genes the ALLs. And ALLs arise when a piece of DNA, when it gets copied to the next generation, somehow it gets copied twice, for example. And then at some point, mutations arise on these genes, such as, such that after a while, they're slightly different. Now, most of the time, these uh, mutations could be disastrous for the organism. Imagine somebody with a hand sticking out of their head. That would be very bad. Um, but um, in general, this allows us to come up with the idea of a gene pool. We have different versions of genes in the human population. And uh, in this case, when we have a, a given species, so they will start off with a bunch of cows, and uh, they are able to interbreed and keep the the gene pool homogeneous. Basically, anywhere in that population, if you sample a number of individuals, you will find all the genes that are possible in that population. But now, natural selection kicks in. It's been uh, called survival of the fittest by some people, <coughs> but it's not quite your general idea of fittest. It doesn't only mean being stronger or faster. In fact, it means you're adapted to the current constraints, the current environment you're trying to live in, such as the weather, the predators, and the availability of food. And uh, to be fit, an individual must be able to survive until sexual maturity, breed, and rear those offsprings into adulthood so that they can pass on the very same genes that built the adult in the first place. And uh, in that case, the successful genes would get passed on more than the less successful ones. And we, call, we say the population is getting fitter. Now, imagine at some point the population splits up. Now, I'll bring in the idea of islands, but if I'm saying island and you think Tenerife, not quite what I mean. In fact, I'll show you something quite remarkable. Um, that's uh, oh wait, 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 and that's 
India over there, except for Antarctica. <coughs> and at that point, a given species living around here would be able to walk around and, in general, breed and mix their genes. However, at some point, India splits off from Antarctica and set off along its, uh, through the Indian Ocean, to its more or less its current place here 50 million years ago. So for a while, India was a proper island in the fact that individuals living here were unable to breed with those living in Antarctica. We have many other such islands, such as South America or Madagascar, Australia, etc. And uh, I'll go back to the previous slide. In fact, lakes, different sides of the lake or sides of a mountain or a valley can do the same job. All it does is keep that population into two separate ones. Now, in those two cases, the individuals living in each section might be under different natural conditions, such as different weather, different set of predators, and different food available to them. And uh, mutation in the genome, or its topic, which is generations, will include, will introduce much diversity. And this is fodder for natural selection to work on. Natural, different selection pressures would act on those two populations. And after a while, their physical properties will start to diverge. And after a few million years, in the case of larger species, larger uh, mammals such as ourselves, uh, you would have different species, such that if you were to bring them together again, they would be unable to produce fertile offspring by breeding. Therefore, we say we have new species. And I'm going to tell you about the field of life now. I've chosen just three uh, species, the humans, the chimpanzees, and the gorilla, all of which are still in existence today. Uh, the theory of evolution is uh, powerful enough that it's got the power of prediction. Using that and noting the similarities between, uh, I've only got the skeletons here, but in general you could uh, come up with a lot of similarities between the three species. <coughs> and uh, we predict that they have a common ancestry. And we assume in this case that there's only dichotomy, in which case a given species gives rise to two at a time, and one of them might give rise to more. And just imagine that this one didn't change, for example, or that could happen. We, we're only talking about two at a time, not three. That, we assume, is not happening, just to simplify our calculations. Now, we have three species we're trying to arrange their ancestry, and there are three ways of doing it. With uh, bunching the humans and the chimps first, and then having a meeting with the gorillas much further back in time. Or the chimp and the gorilla could meet first when going back in time, and then meet the humans. Or the humans and the gorillas could be more similar share closer common ancestry than we do with the chimps. Now you might be tempted to think that us humans are so different from them that they would be closer together. And in fact I'll tell you why it's wrong later. Now one way to choose between those trees would be to count the physical differences between the bodies, such as the length of the limbs, volumes of the skull, uh, the content of the blood or anything you can think of, just count the differences and count the similarities and try to build a tree that would minimize the number of differences. But all visual features, well, most visual features are based on DNA differences anyway. So if we compare the DNA directly, we might be able to decide on the ancestry a lot easier. And uh, that's a picture of a, well, it's too much representation of it amino acid, which is the building blocks of protein. And all you need to know in this case is that you can stick one of these at the end here, and so on, in a one-dimensional uh, linear arrangement of amino acids, which will then fold into the correct three-dimensional structure that proteins have, which allows them to perform the job, such as enzymes to speed up biochemical reactions in our body. They are at the bottom would represent some uh, chemical group that would influence the folding in general. Now, our DNA, and indeed all of life on Earth, shares a 